Hi, I'm Coffee Kevin. My guest today is Justin Doggett. Justin is someone who personifies the quest for what's commonly known simply as cold brew. For some of us older folks, cold brew flies in the face of everything we learned about coffee. Perhaps the most striking difference is to look at the post-World War II coffee brewing standards set by the Pan American Coffee Bureau. It's a trade organization that uh, precedes the current Specialty Coffee Association. Anyway, the temperature range for properly brewing a cup of coffee, according to their standards, was 195 to 205 Fahrenheit. <laughs> Pardon my editorializing, but I think those temperatures were designed to reinforce brewing using the then popular vacuum coffee makers at home and restaurants, perhaps in preference to pumping percolators, which the industry's coffee tasters felt burn coffee, and lower temp pour overs such as the Chemex, which they felt left some coffee flavors on the table, so to speak. Well, Cold brew set the industry on its collective ear when it was introduced, and it's become a big business. There are all kinds of questions that I'd like to ask, and today we have one of cold brew's most passionate proponents, Justin Doggett of Kyoto Black. Mr. Doggett majored in East Indian studies at the University of Delaware and got into coffee like so many as something to do post-coffee, oh, I'm sorry, post-coffee, post-college. I assume before he found the right serious job, after tasting that perfect espresso shot at an Intelligentsia coffee bar in 2011. Well, it's 10 years ago. From there, he became a barista and so excelled that he became head barista and trainer for Metropolis Coffee. He then began experimenting with cold brew and his own Kyoto method and the various flavors he could get using different beans and blends. I met Justin, I think, in 2014 at CoffeeCon Chicago, where he taught our first cold brew class. He will be conducting a cold brew mixed drink class at our CoffeeCon online live event on March 6th. I'm proud to call him my friend when my cousin became medically unable to have hot brewed coffee or coffee uh, grown with any pesticides this past year, I immediately sought Justin's counsel to find a coffee my cousin could drink. I have so many questions. Where do I begin? Uh, welcome, Justin. Hey, thank you for having me, Kevin. It's good to talk to you again. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, Dennis, can you fly in that, that uh, far side cartoon? We're looking at a far side cartoon from Gary Larson. And uh, it's the one uh, that says, uh, Justin, I know you, you probably can't see it where you are. It's the one that says, you know, uh, they're, they're in hell. And they say, hey, they've thought of everything. Even the coffee is cold. And I'm thinking, wow, how did we go from that depiction of cold coffee to the, to the polar opposite today? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the coffee's uh, better, I, I would probably say. <laughs> do, do you, uh, with, what's your... Uh, first experience with cold brew? So uh, back in 2011, I'd started hearing about cold brew, uh, specifically Kyoto style coffee. So I have a kind of interesting background in that. I uh, got into coffee all at once. So uh, as you mentioned, I worked for a, a company that uh, was focusing on the Intelligentsia standard. We use Intelligentsia coffee. And before that, I hadn't really been such a coffee drinker. Um, it was only at this place that I started to learn about espresso. I'd maybe had, you know, two or three espresso shots in my entire life before that. Uh, so I started learning about espresso and uh, cold brew and Kyoto style all at the same time. And to me, uh, espresso and Kyoto style cold brew really stood out as being very uniquely different from every other uh, preparation method. So I just really focused on those, but that was about in 2011 that I found out about it, so. Now, now if you were, you know, Let's say you meet somebody who has never had cold brew, if there's anyone left, but there, I think there are a few, still a few holdouts, and, and particularly, actually, in the very, very high um, geek uh, specialty coffee world, there are some people that just, I think, have narrowed their search. Either they're just, I meet people that just drink espresso, I meet people that just have pour over. Um, how would you suggest one of them approach cold brew if they just wanted to give it an honest test 
I, I think, well, the most accept, uh, accessible way to just try cold brew for the first time uh, is to either go to Starbucks and just try their cold brew um, just to get kind of an idea of what it's like. It's, I would consider it to be a really good approximation of cold brew and depending on just how freshly that batch was made, they'll get a more or less of an idea of how a general average cold brew in America tastes. Uh, if they want to take it one step further, uh, they can brew their own cold brew at home and there are plenty of great recipes. Um, I would start with the uh, recommendations set forth by Toddy. Um, but that is uh, the kind of conventional style of uh, cold brew. If they want to do uh, Kyoto style cold brew, which is, it it's uses cold water, but that's where the similarities really stop. Um, they're really going to have to either uh, specially seek out a Kyoto style cold brew, like for example, my product, or they're going to have to go onto some of the blogs and uh, learn how to do the Kyoto style themselves and get the special equipment needed for that. Now, let's just tease people a little bit. What is the difference, if you had to define, if you had to explain to someone who's already into cold brew what Kyoto style is, uh, how, mm -hmm. would you, how would you begin to put it into words? So basically what I would tell them is that uh, Kyoto style is basically the drip method of making cold brew that essentially we all in the, in the coffee industry know that you have essentially two ways of uh, extracting the coffee flavor from the grounds. And uh, one is immersion and the other is percolation or drip. And uh, essentially most cold brews, they use the immersion method, which is uh, very similar to a French press. Anything where you have the grounds of uh, coffee free floating in the water and then they are filtered out. Um, the Kyoto style method is more akin to a, like a Chemex or any sort of uh, pour over method where you're holding the coffee grounds in place and allowing that water to just drip through and percolate. And there are some unique advantages that you get from drip coffee uh, versus uh, immersion coffee. Um, so if you know, the person listening to this has never had cold brew or has never had Kyoto style coffee, but they know enough about coffee that they've had maybe a French press and a drip coffee, um, if they can remember those different drinking experiences, one thing that they would probably notice is that the drip coffee had uh, just better expression of flavors. It was more, uh, not delicate necessarily, but just more uh, articulated. And uh, whereas the, uh, the, the French press or the immersion uh, typically would have a less clear, a little bit more muddled flavors, it would tend towards more the chocolatey side of the coffee and uh, just have less of that nuance. Uh, not only that, but um, you would typically notice more kind of particulate, more haze in the uh, French press or the immersion coffees as a whole um, versus the pour overs, which is uh, much more clear. And that difference translates into cold brew as well. You know, it's interesting. I always, I love analogies and I also love music and I love sound. And I'm always, I'm always putting things into focus. Uh, to, for other people using analogies to music and sound. And I've, I've sometimes when I had um, your Kyoto style, I've thought it is more detailed. It's what I think of as a more detailed, uh, more balanced. Mm -hmm. Whereas the, um, in effect, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll refer to uh, the other uh, type, the immersion as more of a, uh, and what I think of as tube sound, it's very pleasant, it's very in enjoyable, but it's, but it's not as, um, right. it's hard, I don't pick as many notes out of it. Yeah, to kind of piggyback off the analogy, I would say it's like uh, Kyoto style, it's like playing the piano just with the pedal off and then immersion would be like playing with the pedal on where it just kind of muddles things a little bit more and it's uh, less articulated, less clear little yes. more dampened and soft, but, uh, you know, more uh, nondescript and less offensive, you know. Yeah, no, I get that. Uh, well, I mean, any, uh, what, what, what were some, fa what are your favorites right now? What are you tasting lately that is, you know, getting you the most excited? Uh, I had a uh, Kushi Kamana from uh, Kenya uh, that was roasted by uh, Counterculture. That's been really great. It's got uh, just nice savoriness. I'm big into savory coffees. Um, it also has like this kind of uh, tomato-like herbaceousness, but then it's got this great just blackberry just in that same profile. And it's weird, you're thinking tomatoes and blackberries, that doesn't sound like it goes together very well, uh, but it's more so like the aroma of tomatoes. It's just really excellent. So I like that quite a bit. Um, and then I'm also just enjoying some of the natural processed coffees. Um, because Kyoto style does really have that clear articulation and it's got you know, very high concentration, you can brew 
a strong concentrate without under extracting the coffee. You can properly profile the extraction on the coffee. So you can get some really just wild notes and just amazing notes out of natural processed coffees. So I've been enjoying putting some like Perla Negra through that, for example, uh, which is uh, kind of hitting the market this time of year. So uh, that's been really great. Interesting, interesting. Uh, yeah, a lot of natural coffees, uh, I, I think are uh, the, the, I don't think it's an accident that the uh, proliferation of natural coffees in the, in the world um, is coupled with the increased enjoyment of cold brew and spreading because it seems like you can you can really taste the payoffs yeah. of the uh, of the naturals with cold brew. Yeah, it's a it's a little bit more forgiving of the naturals because sometimes you can get a dryness as well when you prepare it hot. Uh, for some reason, uh, they have kind of like this delicacy that uh, if you brew it with hot water, uh, it comes through as being kind of papery, whereas with cold water, it's much more forgiving. So you just don't get that papery dryness that can happen with naturals so easily. Yeah, it's, it's really uh, amazing. Now is everyone, I, I would like to ask this question, is there anyone that gets cold brew and increases the heat as they consume it? In other words, they actually use cold brew and then they actually warm it up to use it in any recipes. Is that ever done? Uh, so, that, I mean, that's done with my coffee. Um, Aside from that, I don't hear too much about doing that. You know, you can run into different issues, like if it's already diluted, for example, uh, that might not work as well. So like, for example, with my coffee, which is a concentrate, I typically recommend that people add boiling water to it uh, to heat it up. And it's at such a concentration that you uh, don't need that much of it to actually enjoy a hot cup of coffee uh, compared to the amount of water you would use. because. In my heart, at least, I have a problem with kind of just warming up cold coffee. Uh, I would prefer to just add hot water to it, so it has to be a certain strength. I do know that there are people who like to, you know, when their coffee goes cold, um, microwave it or something like that, but we don't talk about those people. So. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I have to draw a line somewhere. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, when I asked you to appear to, on CoffeeCon's uh, upcoming March 6th online live event, you suggested your presentation focus on mixing cold brew with alcohol, mixed drinks in effect. Uh, I'd love to hear more about this. So yeah, um, you've seen several uh, coffee uh, co alcoholic infusions hit the market recently. This is something that I thought would have uh, popped off a long time ago. Um, I started doing coffee cocktails alongside the uh, beverage director at then time uh, beverage director at Cindy's Rooftop Bar. Uh, he and I linked up and started coming up with some coffee focused uh, spirit and spirit free recipes. Uh, just because we felt like there was this uh, demand for a great bespoke coffee cocktail and also for non-alcoholics too. Um, and it's something that I think is finally uh, having its day just like cold brew, which has been around actually for a long time, but it just recently, maybe in the past uh, five years or so, uh, inter the cultural zeitgeist. This is now the next kind of natural progression for that uh, because cold brew is the perfect kind of mechanism for adding coffee flavor to a uh, mixed drink in the first place. And it, in essence, it took cold brew to get to where it is now in order for this next progression to even kind of make sense as far as the, the masses are concerned. You know, uh, coffee cocktails have always existed, but uh, there's still some discord amongst the recipes and amongst the techniques of actually brewing the coffee and adding that flavor to the drink. And that's something that we're just trying to tie up into something that's uh, more elevated. Are uh, cold brew alcohol drinks affected in the, oh, uh, one in the air equals three on the ground kind of way? In other words, is, is, the, is the alcohol effect um, greater because of the, of the mixture? For any reason, really, I'm just curious, this is, you know, I'm just thinking about it that way. You know, I don't know, honestly. Um, a lot of the people who uh, I've had these drinks around, they generally behave themselves pretty well, so it's, I didn't notice a difference. So. <laughs> in, in, the, in the couple of times that I've had um, a mixed drinks, I've had them, at, um, I think for some reason I was, may have been with you, I, I, I know, um, Anyway, I've had a couple of opportunities, and I did not notice a difference. In fact, 
I would say a little less just because it's, I didn't have something that had too much alcohol in it. But um, I, I thought uh, the flavor certainly, I'll tell you what it did. It, 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 to me, it ameliorated some of the flavor that I don't care for. Sometimes I, when I mix alcohol with something, it's not that I'm against alcohol. It's just that it's, it's, it, it can have a, um, an unpleasant taste to it. And I didn't notice any of that mixing it with coffee. I thought, in fact, right. it's really interesting. Yeah, well, when we made our recipes, we were very intentional about actually starting with the coffee first. And then from there, because there's such a great array of uh, wonderful spirits that are available that were not available before, you know, it was not common for people to have uh, access to grappa or any of these other uh, spirits that we now have uh, access to that just blend much better with coffee. So um, we're, you know, we're moving beyond just your simple, you add whiskey and cream to, to um, a, a coffee and you got yourself coffee cocktail. We're starting with the coffee flavor first and then looking at what spirits can complement certain uh, aspects of that coffee and then also just what would be kind of fun to drink what would be crushable what would be more sophisticated you know just depending on kind of what kind of mood and even what kind of vessel we want to highlight um, and also temperatures as well we have some uh, hot drinks and, and cold drinks that are uh, uh, coffee cocktails so we have a lot of fertile ground to play with as far as uh, using different coffees as the the focal point and then mixing those with spirits so it's I, I, I liken it to just kind of how the third wave of coffee worked, where it's we really are focusing on the coffee first, and then the spirits are uh, there to kind of reinforce the natural uh, existing flavors within the coffee, rather than just saying, "Hey, let's take this cocktail and just make a coffee version of it. Let's do a coffee martini. Let's just like throw coffee yeah, into yeah. a drink." We want to say, "Okay, how can we make a coffee re beverage where the coffee is clearly the central element of it?" And that's you know that's that's right, and that's what I. Uh, at the last Future of Coffee uh, panel, um, that was why it was predicted that I thought this was the next, you know, people are ask, always asking, what's the fourth wave? And, you know, I, <laughs> I don't know with coffee for sure, but I, I can tell you this, I think, is, a, is, a, is a, certainly an area that I could see a lot of consumer interest. And uh, it, just, it just seems like a natural mm -hmm. um, uh, place to go to that, that plays with coffee as a ma the main ingredient but the but yet yeah, nevertheless an ingredient in a drink in a beverage and how you can all the things you can do with it wow talk about multiplying the tastes you get from coffee and making it something yeah. that, you know all day <laughs> one of the simplest but just most uh, enjoyable drinks we have is the coffee and tonic we do a, a cold brew tonic and it's just like incredible uh, the way the bitterness and the sweetness and the uh, citrus flavors just match with like a really well paired coffee, in this case like an Ethiopian coffee, uh, it just plays so well with tonic, it's incredible. Wow, that is incredible. That's a, that's a, what tonics are uh, of interest to me. Now, if someone wants to make beverages similar to what you're going to be ta showing us while uh, they're online attending CoffeeCon, will you publish an ad any kind of advanced supplies list for someone that? Would, would have an interest? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and then we also, if they visit my website, uh, kyotostylecoffee.com, uh, they can check out my blog and we got some recipes there as well. Wow, that's uh, amazing. Hey, uh, how's, I have to ask, how's COVID affected your business? Uh, it's going great, actually. Um, I noticed that as the lockdown started to happen, um, I was just getting an increase of orders, which is very fortunate for me um because i deliver the coffee so it's a it's a mail service and most of the the cafes in my area were closing down so for a while i was the only game in town and uh, i was willing to ship out the coffee to people or leave it on their doorstep and have them come out and grab it uh, it's in a nice convenient pouch so it's great you know they just keep it in the fridge and anytime they want a cup of coffee they just follow the instructions so it's very no fuss way and uh because you know, I really focus on having just a quality product. I think people started to kind of talk about it more, and I was getting just flooded with orders to the point where uh, this past you know December was better than last July for me. And you know, uh, December is usually pretty much dead, um, except for Christmas, and uh, July is like peak cold brew drinking time. And this past December was just an order of several fold better than last summer. So. That leads to an interesting uh, question as well. 
have we reached the point where cold brew is, for instance, uh, I'll, I'll just use an example, whether it's Coca-Cola or a, a chilled white wine. Um, we, I think we've reached the point that people who enjoy those beverages don't think twice about what month it is to order one. Uh, is, is that- That's 100% uh, right. Is yeah. that cold brew now in current times? It is, I would say it definitely is. Um, it's still within pockets of the culture. So there are still some people who, you know, I tell them I only sell cold coffee and they give me a strange look, but I'm getting fewer and fewer strange looks every single day, so. It's very, it's, it's very gratifying to see, you know, to witness um, this transformation in the industry from what cold coffee used to be, as, as uh, Gary Larson pointed out, it used to be considered a, a, a negative uh, just from the get-go, but now certainly not. And, uh, and certainly uh, a really innovative uh, way to, uh, to think about coffee. And, I, and I, would like to, I would like to think that eventually it's got to affect the standards, or, or I'm, sure they'll, I'm sure they'll work on trying to develop standards for or cold brew, but um, certainly an out-of-the-box answer. And by the way, I want to compliment you. Uh, when, I, when I contacted everybody that I wanted to invite to CoffeeCon to present, uh, you instantly came up with an innovative uh, way of doing it that was completely different than what I expected, to be honest. And, uh, and I, I really appreciate that kind of creativity. Absolutely, it's, it's, it's what I strive to do. So I, I like just problem solving and uh, making things happen. So glad wow. to help. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm happy yeah. to. Yeah, I'm happy to make that list public. So perfect, and that's uh, and of course it, you know help increase sales too. So always I'm I'm totally pro capitalism. So that's <laughs> fine with me. <laughs> well, it's really a pleasure to uh, meet with you like this. And this was an experiment. We're using the same technology that we're going to be using for the to the uh, for the actual event and uh, so on March 6 we will schedule you for the middle of the day and uh, first thing in the afternoon if we can work that out and and uh, as always uh, it's great to uh, great to speak with you and I can't wait to uh, see you in person again soon thank you very much yeah it's great to see you too again Kevin so take care best of luck with the event <laughs> thank you Justin Doggett will be teaching you how to mix cold brew cocktails live from Metropolis Coffee on March 6th. His ingredient list will be posted so you can enjoy a coffee cocktail during the event. Get your questions ready and be sure to register for CoffeeCon Online live today. I've gathered an amazing array of top coffee experts to teach you how to brew and taste coffee. You won't want to miss the legendary inventor of the AeroPress coffee maker, Alan Adler. Mr. Adler will tell us how he invented the AeroPress and will answer your questions live. Kenneth Davids of the Coffee Review and countless books on coffee will lead our tasting class. Taste right alongside him during our tasting presentation. Post your own notes and ask questions. I have many more classes including a grinding class with Baratza's Pierce Jens Folkman. You won't want to miss any of it but you must register to chat with the experts as well as win coffee and equipment prizes at CoffeeCon's world-famous prize drawing. Remember, it's all free to experience, online and live, March 6th. Just register at coffee-con.com. I'm Coffee Kevin. <laughs>